EMS personnel must be able to safely handle the rapidly growing number of calls for possible cases of COVID-19 in a variety of settings, making vital decisions quickly, sometimes with limited information and resources. Knowing how to safely assess a patient who may potentially be infected with COVID-19 is critical to keep first responders safe. EMS clinicians must also be able to transport that patient safely to a medical facility in order to mitigate risks to themselves, their patients, and the public. By the end of this course, you will be able to Explain how to safely assess patients with known or potential cases of COVID-19. Discuss how to limit potential exposure to COVID-19 at a scene and in a medical transport vehicle. Describe how to safely transport a patient who has or may have COVID-19 to a medical facility. Recall the steps a first responder must take after transporting the patient to a medical facility. If dispatchers have identified a call as a possible case of COVID-19, first responders must be sure to properly don PPE before entering the patient care scene. Be sure you are aware of all the symptoms, signs, and risk factors associated with COVID-19. Refamiliarize yourself with such criteria here from the CDC. There may be calls where dispatch has not identified COVID-19 as a potential condition of the patient, but EMS responders suspect the patient may be infected. In these instances, such as a patient who tells you he or she has a fever and signs of a respiratory infection, contact with the patient should be minimalized as much as possible until the patient has been provided a face mask. If possible, the patient assessment in these instances should be conducted at least six feet from the patient. If the patient shows symptoms of COVID-19, first responders should put on all necessary PPE. There may be instances when a patient may need care that requires an aerosol-generating procedure, such as endotracheal intubation, nebulizer treatments, continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. In accordance with your local medical protocol, consider whether an alternative means of bronchodilation can be achieved and the risk-benefit to the patient and the rescuers by performing or deferring this treatment until the patient is at the hospital. With respect to advanced airway management, consider using a supraglottic airway versus endotracheal intubation. And lastly, in the case of CPR, minimize rescuer exposure and follow your local medical protocol and their latest guidance on treatment and transport of cardiac arrest patients. In these cases, an N95 respirator or higher level respirator should be worn by the first responders making contact with the patient. EMS personnel should speak with medical control before performing the procedure and be extremely cautious. To filter expired air, the CDC advises that BVMs and other ventilatory equipment be equipped with HEPA filtration. If being performed in a transport vehicle, aerosol generating procedures should be done, if possible, with the rear doors open and HVAC system on, and the vehicle away from pedestrian traffic. If a patient is suspected of having COVID-19 due to their symptoms and exposure history, the patient will likely need to be taken to a hospital or emergency care facility. Consider the following recommendations from the CDC when transporting potential COVID-19 patients. Notify the facility. Make sure the hospital or healthcare facility has as much time as they can to prepare for necessary infection control. Notify the facility of the incoming patient's symptoms and exposure history immediately. Limit exposure in transport vehicle. Allow no more EMS providers in the patient compartment of the ambulance than necessary and keep the patient separate from other people as much as possible. Your agency will likely have guidance on this topic, but as a best practice, family members should not ride in the vehicle with the suspected patient unless they are the patient's power of attorney, surrogate for care, 
parent of a minor or the like, and they do not have any other means to get to the hospital themselves. Common sense and a risk-benefit analysis must ultimately rule the day. But if they do ride along, they should wear a face mask for their protection and yours. Be aware of potential cross-contamination in the vehicle between the patient transport area and the cab. If the driver of the vehicle assisted in transporting the patient into the back of the vehicle, the driver should be sure to remove any exposed PPE and sanitize hands prior to entering the cab. Properly ventilate the vehicle. If possible, use a transport vehicle with separate ventilation systems for driver and passenger compartments. Keep the ambulance driver away from the patient compartment. Keep windows and pass-through doors tightly shut or sealed. Before bringing patients into the vehicle, close doors and windows between the driver or patient compartments. If possible, ventilation in both compartments should be non-recirculated. Rear exhaust ventilation may be used to pull air away from the cab, toward the patient care area, and out the back of the vehicle. If transporting the patient in an ambulance without isolated driver and patient compartments, open outside air vents in the driver area and turn on rear exhaust ventilation fans to their maximum setting, creating a negative pressure gradient in the patient area. After transport. After transport is completed, remove PPE, sanitize hands, and begin patient documentation. Whatever was told to the emergency care providers at the time of transport needs to be documented as well. Documentation should also include a list of all of the first responders and patient care providers who responded to the call. Each person's level of contact with the patient should be documented, such as no contact with the patient or provided direct patient care. In addition, all electronic patient care reports EPCRs have a pick list to select the PPE worn by each rescuer. Do this each and every time. It is not enough to just tag Engine 34 on the event as an example. Instead, select all of the personnel and their roles whenever this is a possibility. These are data elements that are used by local, state, and federal authorities. In the event that this information is needed, and there will be cases where it is needed, make the case with clear and concise information for reviewers after the fact. This course has discussed in detail critical information for first responders who may have to respond to calls that potentially involve cases of COVID-19. Please review any topics you feel were most important. Always refer to CDC guidelines for more information, and always remember to follow all local protocols that may be in place.